Hello Kindred Longevity Lifestyle Designers, this is Zach here with SecretSelfLongevity.com and I've got some very interesting questions this week for Q&A on Sunday. And the first one is from Richard and he's asking, um, he just, well he's commenting on the fact that he just read an article at dietary, dietaryfiberfood.com slash phytoestrogen.php. I'll provide a link below if you want to have a look at this because this is uh, something I've referred to in the past um, in terms of looking at the phytoestrogen content of food. There's a whole chart. And garlic is actually on the list, and he was asking me about garlic. And um, he's saying he's experienced higher libido after garlic consumption, and he's saying that he thought it was an aphrodisiac, yet it doesn't have these phytoestrogens, and what does that mean? And what are my thoughts on it for this reason? Now, specifically, Garlic, yes, it's considered an aphrodisiac because it has properties in it that are um, very heating, almost can be almost slightly irritating in higher doses. And this is the same reason that cayenne, black pepper, any spicy food is actually considered to have aphrodisiac properties, even ginger, because it has the ability to open up blood flow to the periphery of our body. So if you suffer from cold hands a lot, it can help to take in hotter, spicy foods, and that can bring blood flow to the extremities, but it works in the same respect to the bringing blood flow to the genitals. It is actually uh, in the lily family, and it is sort of seen as similar in the types of foods that are high in sulfur, like onions, radishes, even kale, and in the brassica family, like kale and broccoli, which are also high in sulfur. And all these foods that are high in sulfur tend to be uh, aphrodisiacs and they increase testosterone. So despite the fact that it has a phytoestrogen content around, according to this article, 603.6 units of phytoestrogens per 100 grams. And when you consider flaxseed has 379,380 and soy has 103,920, uh, garlic is per weight, and by weight, it's a lot less high in phytoestrogens, and also you have to consider that you're not going to be consuming a large amount of garlic all at once. So some people do for a brief span of time, but even if you were to consume garlic daily, you're not going to be consuming more than two or three cloves tops. Any more than that, it can be a bit unsafe in the long term in my opinion, but um, yeah, it's sort of around a medium to low phytoestrogen content for a food, even though they have it on the chart here. Um, it's definitely higher than mung beans and uh, sunflower seeds, olive oil, almonds, which are ones that are often talked about as being phytoestrogen containing foods, but it's definitely lower than a lot of the um, staple foods that people consume. So when I, when I talk about phytoestrogens, is I mainly talk about avoiding the things that you're going to eat continuously in larger amounts that are high in phytoestrogens like soy, flax, green tea, um, black beans, all of these foods which could be taken in as staples on a daily basis are going to be the ones that really can alter your endocrine system the worst as compared to taking a little small amount of garlic on a semi-regular basis. But in my opinion, the androgenic or testosterone boosting capabilities of garlic actually outweigh the phytoestrogen content, so there's really no harm um, on the endocrine system level in taking it for that reason. The next question is from James Joe on Facebook, and he's asking, uh, in regards to the video I did on sleeping, whether you could, instead of covering the window with black drapes, uh, could you put a simply put a cover over your eyes and this is because he lives in a climate that's very hot and I'd say that's not going to have the same effect um, unfortunately if you live in a very hot place I'd look into um, getting some sort of air ventilation or air circulation that is um, in another room that you can direct into that room but keep the window well, you can have the window open if you have black drapes and you're able to have sort of a very ambient breeze coming through cloth but um, obviously if you have a plastic bag on the window, that's going to be like having a window closed. And there are health benefits to having a window open. There's kind of two sides to this um, issue here. But yeah, if you're just putting something over your eyes thinking that that's going to have the same effect, it's not. Because when you sleep, you obviously have your eyes open and it's blocking out a lot of light. But the thing we're talking about here is ambient light in the room is being picked up on a very subtle level by your pineal gland. It is coming through a bit on your eyelids. 
Uh, it's a, your whole body is sensitive to light, and um, it's not a concept many people can grasp necessarily, but it does alter your biochemistry when you're around even very dim lights at night, and uh, you have your skin exposed to it, basically. And your other part of that question was, can this affect testosterone and human growth hormone protection? Yes, it can. Melatonin is an overarching hormone to and helps regulate all the other hormones of the body, so naturally testosterone and growth hormone are tied into that. Tristan is asking um, about saving Jing and what I think about men consuming their own semen as opposed to um, the withholding ejaculation techniques I've spoken about. And your point was that withholding ejaculation can make Jing stagnate, and I do hear you on that. If people are withholding ejaculation without doing proper exercises that um, I refer to in certain books, um, yes, you can end up having a stagnated Jing. And that's actually worse than just going ahead and ejaculating on a semi-regular basis. Um, so the ideal situation is to practice semen retention with the proper exercises, if you're not doing the exercises, you should be ejaculating because it's, like you said, it's going to be building up in the body and causing um, blockages in your um, energy flow through your body. Now, in terms of eating your own semen, my honest personal opinion about that is that it is weird and it's not something that I personally feel drawn to, but if you happen to be drawn to that, that's perfectly fine. I can't think of a biological reason or biochemical reason as to any harm in that. Um, however, the thinking that it's going to have the same benefit as withholding ejaculation isn't uh, correct because by through ejaculating you're losing more than just the physical semen and just consuming that again your body has to break all that down again and then reassemble it and that's a big portion of the energy that it takes. Um, there's people that notice that when they have a vasectomy their energy levels actually start to increase and that's partly because they're, they can still ejaculate but they're no longer um, ejaculating the actual sperm with that, they're just, they have the ejaculate fluid that is the vehicle for the sperm. It's made in a different place than your testicles. So there is that factor that you have to take into consideration that you're ejecting um, actual sperm and you have to remanufacture that every time. And that is actually where the jing is most concentrated, not so much in the fluids which have a lot of the minerals and other things, but the actual sperm cells themselves, um, when your body has to make those, it's very taxing on your life force. Tony has recently asked me what types of algae Brian is talking about that he incorporates into his diet. And he, Brian, Dr. Brian Clement talks about five different types of algae that he consumes on a daily basis. And I'm not sure of every single one of them, but I know that he definitely takes uh, Klamath Lake algae, also known as Aphanazomenon flossaqua which is basically E3 Live. That's the company brand that's most popular. Um, he takes uh, chlorella, he would take spirulina, and the other two I'm not entirely sure, but I'm suspecting one of them is one of the red-brown algaes, which I've personally never taken. I've never actually even seen it on shelves anywhere, but um, I've read about it, and it sounds interesting, and it has quite different properties because it's different, uh, completely different color. <laughs> It's not as green or it's not a green-blue algae, it's like a red-brown algae, um, and it's edible. But yeah, you can check out links below if you want to have a look at more any of those in, more in-depth. Just the three I, first three I talked about that I'm more familiar with, the AFA, which is a fan of Aqua, the spirulina, and the chlorella. And the brands that are best for, well, for AFA, which is Klamath like algae, I'd definitely say E3 Live because it's fresh and frozen. That is definitely optimal uh, because it's going to be the most preserved of it in its natural state. It's the only algae that I'm aware of that's actually wild. Chlorella and spirulina are farmed in sort of big cylindrical vats. And that's fine, but it's not as beneficial as something growing out in nature. Chlorella tablets are great because you can travel with them. And I use the Ultimate Superfood brand, which you can find at the link below. And they just look like little um, pellets, I guess. And you can just pop them in your mouth on the fly, you don't need to mix it with water, and you can also get spirulina tablets, or you can get just the plain powder that you mix with water, and um, the only thing you have to watch out when eating is out in public, is you're going to make all your teeth scream, you might get on your face, I had an embarrassing experience 
recently where I was picking it out of my teeth because it kind of gets caught in there. And I had green all around my mouth, but I was walking around downtown with this green stuff on my face that people were just like staring at me. It was quite funny, but I'm more conscious of that now. Anyways, have a great week. Ask more questions throughout the week and embrace life without limits.